Hello and welcome. This is uh, my presentation for CurlUp 2022 about curl security. I call it past and present attacks and mitigations. Maybe it isn't that suitable of a topic or the extended title, but anyway, we will get to that. So uh, thank you for uh, watching. Let's get to this. Um, uh, we, of course, know that doing safe code is not a coincidence and we really have to work on it and in the call project we certainly care about it so this is nothing so that we don't we don't leave this unattended or or casually um, leaving it for, for chance so really what we do in, in the curl project our pretty much our focus or our method to actually provide secure code is very simple it's, there's nothing magic about this we do clean code that follows the code style we make sure that we write code in a cohesive coherent style uh, and we review each other's suggestions pull requests code and we test them as much as we can well them all the code actually as much as possible and we verify the code with analyzers, stress tests, fuzzing, and whatever methods we can do and find. And we offer bug bounties then to, to help users, security researchers to actually spend the time to find those flaws that slip into this anyway, in spite of our efforts to, to, to do everything correctly. And if they do find things or anyone else finds things actually we act on those mistakes this is really nothing special nothing magic but this is the method we do clean code review test verify bug bounty and then we act on the mistakes when we f get them anyway and of course to make sure or sort of so maybe to help us avoid acting on mistakes avoid, sort of to help us uh, deprive the security researchers of their bug bounties we have a ci system and we have more than it says 100 builds here but we're we're over 110 uh, ci jobs now per commit and per pull request and all these ci's they test code style indenting of course just make sure that we write the code it doesn't actually verify exactly everything in, in code style wise but a lot of things so it catches most obvious sort of breakage of code style and we have thousands of tests per build so it adds up to a lot of testing uh, in a lot of combinations on a lot of platforms for every little change that we want to do to then help us not accidentally ship or you know commit bad code so a lot of cpu hours per commit 20 25 hours it says here and um, it's an old number i haven't actually checked it recently might be a little bit more now so we um, of course then have a lot of test cases we have uh, i think we are at around uh, 1530 something test cases now and writing test cases is supposed to be easy we have a test suite that makes it actually pretty easy to write a test case and even actually easy to read a test case and it's in a semi-human readable documented format on how to write it so the most simple test case is just well maybe 50 lines uh, or so maybe slightly more it depends on exactly when you want to test of course and for each test case it has conditions or features that are needed to for this particular test case to run so for example you can say we only test this feature if curl was built with blah 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 enabled like ssh support or tls support or support for this particular feature um, that it needs to be there before this test runs so otherwise it would be stupid to run the test and there are of course details on exactly what command line to run because in most of the tests not necessarily all of them but uh, we try to make um, tests the primary test case is running curl command lines so specify the test as a curl command line and that's the easiest way to do it and of course, what exactly the servers should return. Wh whatever you do in the protocol, what should the server return? And we check that the server returns exactly that, or that curl receives exactly that from the server, you know, byte per byte, exactly that every time. And that, of course, verifies that the protocol exchange is exactly that. It does, so whatever change we do, the protocol exchange remains intact exactly that. <clears throat> and of course, standard out and standard error contents. Um, 
we can check them. We don't necessarily always do that, but we can do that. An expected error code look We should check that the curl returns the presumed error code. Well, fine in most cases, but we can also verify that it actually detects errors properly so that it returns whatever error code it should return. And, you know, it's a wide uh, a variety of different things you can specify in a test case. There's a huge array of optional things to add in a test case if you want to. And to do to run all these tests, we have custom test servers. Um, we don't. We try to avoid using you know regular servers, and, and we write our own test servers so that we can make them you know behave or misbehave or send exactly what kind of crap or proper thing we want them to do in the test cases. That makes them uh, much easier to control on, and you know tell and, and demand to do stupid things or good things. So basically. If doing a real server is often overkill when it comes to testing. It's better to just have a stupid server and we just tell it, answer this, blep. And this server usually doesn't even really know the protocol. It just acts as the test instructs it. And it, it makes it easier to, to do crazy behavior or completely wrong, you know, protocol violations and stuff like that and make sure that curl detects it or not detect it or, or whatever it needs to do. And it also helps uh, the test suite actually build and run everywhere. And that is often um, often a sort of a challenge with the test suite is it, to maintain the portability to make sure that it runs everywhere because curl is super portable and getting the curl suite to be as portable, getting the test suite to be as portable is, is a challenge. Most of the TLS work is done by S-Tunnel. Um, um, so, so it fronts the test servers and allows us to use our own custom servers um, without doing all the TLS server-side code ourselves. And since a few years, uh, we, we run all those test servers on random port numbers. And why is that uh, curious to you? Well, it helps with primarily one thing. You can run multiple tests at the same time. You know, you can run the same test on multiple instances on the same machine because it runs on, on um, random port numbers. So um, basically, you know, you can fire up test one and see the in G in GDB there, and you can run, start another shell and and run test one there as well, um, and they won't collide simply because they run on different test uh, port numbers. Or you can, you know, run test suites in parallel uh, in other ways on the same machine on the same port number uh, ranges. Anyway, so of course. That's sort of just how we do testing. And of course, we use all the tools. Again, we don't have any silver bullets. We don't have any magic tricks. We use everything that we can, everything that is provided to us and whatever we can. So we use, in in, C, in the CI builds, we use Valgrind, of course. We do Clang Sanitizer builds and we use Clang Tidy. I think we actually stopped using Tidy recently because it's not really, it's a little bit over, sensitive sometimes uh, and we do our torture tests i will get back to them because they are one of our best tools to make uh, make leap curl really solid uh, in all the error cases and of course we also inspect the code so we do scan build that's actually still a better uh, code analyzer than clang tidy so we do uh, scan build which is a clang uh, tool so static code analyzer, we use the LGTM and Lyft and CodeQL static code, an code analyzers. They're all fairly similar and they actually rarely find flaws uh, in our code. Um, but, and we used to use a few other code analyzers. It's a fun thing these days that code, uh, code analyzers, they seem to come and go and they seem to be popular to do, you know, it's easy to do them in, in sort of in the cloud and, and offer them to open source projects and we use them and sometimes they come, sometimes they go. Uh, our, the primary one in the project is actually, or maybe I should say primary, the one that seems to be the, finds the most actual flaws and seems to be the best actually is Coverity and we run that on the code every now and then. Um, I try to do it roughly weekly or so. And we always address the problems uh, it identifies. And of course, we to do all this CI stuff, we use these six different um, CI services. And we also have a few build bots that run on top of that. So we have a bunch of different services. 
that's how we get up to those 113, I think, CI jobs right now, something like that. <clears throat> and of course, on top of that, we also sort of, we, we run fuzzing or we don't run the fuzzers here because we, we are part of the OSS fuzz project, which is a Google run project and they fuzz curl code nonstop. They actually update uh, from curl master regularly and run fuzzing on that code and reports to us uh, they report to us if they find any flaws or you know crashes or whatever they rarely find anything these days we also uh, run ci fuzz which is part of the same project but it, it helps us run fuzzing on a, a commit and pull request for x number of minutes in each pull request i think we'd run it for 40 minutes it helps us detect obvious stupid flaws before we merge and i mentioned torture tests and I want to uh, explain what they are in case you have missed out this golden little thing that we have in the project. So basically we do this, we build curl specifically. So, well, what you do that when you develop a curl, right? <laughs> Sorry. Mm, uh, so you, when you build curl with the debug option, we use, <coughs> we provide wrapper functions for all functions, well, for a lot of fallible f system functions, you know, malloc, socket, uh, stirred up, you know, f open, a lot of those so uh, functions that possibly could fail in a, in a typical use case. And we have a lot of wrappers for those, and each of those wrappers can actually return error then instead of doing the real thing. So you could sort of tell it to return error for don't succeed in this malloc return an error instead. So by doing this, um, instrumental sort of having those wrapper functions we then when we run a test case in torture mode we first run the complete test case and we count the number of fallible functions invoked you know how many malloc how many stirred up how many f open how many socket and blah 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 so maybe in a, in a typical test case we do uh, say 100 of those function invokes maybe 300 um totally depend on the test cases. I think that the, the easiest ones are maybe in, in the range of 100. Yeah. But anyway, so we know that we have 100 you know, function invokes that are fallible. They can fail in, in a system. And then we iterate then over that same test case 100 times. And we make each of those function calls fail once. So for the first function call fails, and then the second, and then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. So sort of iterate over all of them to make sure that none of them cause a crash, none of them cause a memory leak. Uh, this is this is actually an awesome way to make sure that curl behaves properly. It's, a, it's just the best possible way to verify the exit paths in all of these situations. And it's actually very hard to do in, in other tests. So when, uh, and of course, uh, repeating this uh, several hundred times per test and we have 1500 something and an increasing number of tests that's a lot of you know testing and repeating and doing things so it's it's a very tedious and slow test we have some methods to to do this and to, to avoid running all the tests so it's uh, it doesn't always run all all the combinations in all tests for every um, commit but still this helps us find flaws repeatedly and of course we have this uh, we have a source code policy which means that source code that we land in the code we should ideally or actually we should fix all warnings um, this is sometimes easier said than done but um, so uh, usually it is easier to fix on the main platforms but it's sometimes hard to fix on every you know long tail platform or every legacy unix box out there because sometimes they are so now you know mutually exclusive you fix on one you get it back on another but we do our best and we fix them on all the major things you know with the big compilers on the big platforms and we don't leave any known defects left that any code analyzer finds we actually work hard to also nuke all the false positives so that we don't get any warnings so that we once we get a warning we know how to take it seriously and so we use all the strictest and most picky options we can in all the compilers we use in, in the ci and in testing just to make sure that we find as much as possible and we test then as, we add as many tests as possible really um, for whatever we bug we fixes uh, bugs we fix and features we add we add test cases and 
of course, as soon as we get a security issue reported, we fix that as soon as possible. Uh, and then usually people then come, when I say, uh, well, curl happens to run on, on, we have been informed about it running on 86 different operating systems and 22 different CPU architectures. Uh, and you know, and a lot of combinations in there. So that's a, that's a astounding number of combinations and platforms, right? How, but how, so how do we make sure that curl runs and works on all of these? And of course, testing on all combinations is simply, uh, that's just not possible, right? It's it, quite impossible. It's not, and not not only have we many different operating systems and CPU architectures, there's, there are also, you know, literally millions of build combinations too on the same, uh, OS and CPU combinations as well. But so we test the common setups. And since we have portable code, a lot of code is shared among all those operating and CPUs anyway. So it's actually not necessary to test on all operating systems and CPUs. Um, but we test on as many platforms as we can, and we test on as many different CPU architectures, and we try to do them, you know, both big endy and little endy, and those who can you know, align on, on on uneven addresses and so on, and those who don't. So, so to make sure that we at least get a representative from each of those sp special peculi peculiarities of, of different things. But of course, there are certainly white spots in in, um, in what we test. And, and in those cases, we just have to handle those by review or frankly, allowing that f for users to test and report when we ship things. Um, so users keep finding, you know, those untested areas and certainly build combinations and certainly build combinations on particular platforms that we just don't have in the CI setup or, or, or the auto build setup. That's just limitations we have to live with and, and, and re the reality we are in. And we have this bug bounty uh, we have in the core project since a few years back. It is done in uh, cooperation with Hacker One. That's so we run it on HackerOne.com. It is being supported, sponsored by the Internet Bug Bounty. That's why we have this little logo on there that I'm going to hide now with my face instead. Uh, so uh, the Internet Bug Bounty is a s special project within Hacker One, and they actually take care of the Bug Bounty reward part f for for our pro uh, Bug Bounty program. So basically, you go to hackerone.com slash curl, you report your issues, we manage them, we confirm, we work with the reporter, how do you reproduce it, what's, what's the actual harm here, we work on writing security advisories, we come up, we synchronize so that we know when to announce this, and we work on getting a CVE, so once we have a fix, we have an advisory, we can publish everything in a responsible and, and secure way. Uh, and then once we have, uh, actually once after we have published everything in association with a new release, uh, uh, the rewards are handled by the IBB then. And we have so far in the bug bounty, actually, I would say it like this, in the, in the history of curl, we have paid 40,000 uh, USD or more than that uh, in bug bounties. We have actually changed the bug bounty a little bit over the time, but in total we are, have paid this amount of money and it seems to actually work. We get a fair amount of attention and we get we give rewards to security researchers and hopefully this will keep them looking, keep them pounding on curl code and finding flaws because finding flaws is good, right? Fixing them is better than not knowing about them. Very current uh, uh, news or what is happening right now status, we have a code audit pending and it's more than actually pending. It's like this, this, this organization called OSTIF, they are working where they actually, we actually got a sponsorship by OpenSSF. They have engaged OSTIF to do a code audit, code review of curl. And they have then purchased this service from the company called Trail of Bits. They actually requested a proposal from a different, a number of different companies and Trail of Bits, uh, is the winner of that sort of, they got the order. Um, and they are going to do this uh, code audit, code review during September 2022, which is now. 
they actually already started. We've had our first meetings and we're going to do have, have it more um, as we proceed through the month. There's going to be a report. Um, we're going to publish, uh, publish that, of course, as much as possible and every possible outcome and, and information from this after the everything is completed it's going to be at some point in october i presume i'm very uh, curious eager uh, a little bit scared uh, on where we will go with that so just then uh, looking a little bit back on where we are sort of just um, vulnerabilities i think i showed this in, in in another presentation but this shows just my graph over vulnerabilities in curl when we introduced a vulnerability and we, when we fixed them in the project. So certainly vulnerabilities have to be introduced before they are fixed. So therefore there's always going to be red ones to the left of the green ones here, right? But uh, at least we can see that we don't seem to introduce them at uh, the same pace uh, anymore, maybe. And we seem to fix them pretty good uh, at to fix them at a pretty good rate uh, recently. And, and uh, you can see there in 2022, we've fixed a lot of CVEs, uh, 13 of them just this year, or is it 14? In 2016, as you can see the record amount there, number of, of uh, CVEs we fixed, that's primarily because of a separate code audit it's in the same style that we're having now. So who knows maybe we'll reach that level in 2022 as well after we have gotten that code audit done <coughs> um, we can also see uh, the bug bounty reward level per individual flaw that we have received a report to and in this case well i think the main takeaway here is that uh, the levels have gradually increased from, from the first one we gave a reward to back in 2018, which was just a few hundred dollars. And then we've gone up to, and the graph here is a little bit misleading maybe because it mixes severity levels. So as you can see, the ones in um, absolutely highest levels here, they are severity level medium, while the ones, the two most recent one, the one at the right side here, they are severity low. So that's why there are 480 for the low severity and there are $2,400 for the medium ones. So that's why they differ so much at the, at the recent ones. But uh, since we joined the IBB for, for the uh, rewards, they're actually at a fixed amount. So that's why they're so edgy. This, they're 2400 and they're 480 depending on severity level and we've only had low severity and medium severity for a very long time we had a high one ages ago years ago at least <coughs> so uh, looking at the uh, this fun thing is how long did the code linger in uh, well how long did the flaw linger in code before we fixed it so basically uh, from the day of the commit or from the release that we introduced the flaw until the release when we fixed the flaw. Uh, the, these blue bars are the number of days they existed in the code base. <coughs> the, the most recent one existed in 8,729 days. The new project record, as you can see, was almost the entire project age. It's going to be a hard record to beat. Uh, so it just proves that bugs flaws lingering code usually for a very long time until found um, i'm not sure what it says because people are certainly looking for them so it's not lack of trying it's uh, certainly that i think it shows that it's hard to find security flaws and this i like this kind of uh, the, I like this graph because it, sh it shows the, the, red one, the uh, top one, the red one here is when we introduced a vulnerability then, just the number of vulnerabilities. And the green one is when we fixed them as uh, the number of fixed vulnerabilities. <coughs> so I don't know what it shows. Maybe it shows that uh, uh, it goes, we, we fixed them. And of course they linger around for a pretty long time on average. So at any given time through uh, 
through the history, there has been uh, quite a large number of, of outstanding flaws that we hadn't found yet. I guess that just comes natural. And of course, we fix every security flaw in the next version. We have actually only failed with one particular security flaw ever reported in the project. Um, and that's, you can see that quite clearly in this graph. Yeah, that was the one in back in 2016. And the reason why we didn't fix it in the, in the next release was quite simply because it was such a complicated thing. We didn't really understand it sufficiently to, to know what to do or how to treat it. So we had to research it more and then it, so that it took a longer time, basically twice, two release cycles, I guess, maybe a little bit more. <clears throat> But since then, we have always fixed the problem in the next release. And that's why the sort of the time from security report to ship fix tend to be then within our release cycles are 56 days, right? So usually we fix everything within 56 days. Um, and th so, okay, the, the question then is, of course, does all our measures or ways to try to fix improve curl, does it actually work? Do we improve over time or do we just, you know, randomly still continue to get problems? Uh, but um, we don't, ha I mean, having 10 billion installations that I maintain that curl has, we that's not a proof of success, right? It does, that doesn't actually prove that this works. But maybe in the number of decreasing introduction, introduced CVs is a sign. I'm not sure we, we actually can tell that yet because I think um, we need more time to tell that we actually have a decreasing number. Um, we certainly have a decreasing number of OSS fuss reports over time. Not sure that actually is a good sign either. We have a manageable maybe number of C mistakes. Um, I'll get to that also show you another graph. And we have certainly have an increasing bounty rewards, increasing, I mean, the amounts, the the, so that helps us get more attention. So I think I think we're in a good shape. I'm not sure we actually sort of prove that everything is fine and dandy. Um, so I, I, I sometimes talk about the vulnerabilities in the terms of C mistakes versus non C mistakes and C mistakes then I qualify as mistakes that are classical mistakes due to us using the C language, you know, uh, buffer overflows, buffer reading outside the buffers in general, uh, null pointer mistakes and, and stuff like that. Things that would have been avoided if we had used a language that was memory safe. And, and um, here's my recent update of that. So basically the green one is number of flaws over time that are not C mistakes and the red one are flaws over time that are C mistakes or were. So you can see that, well, the number of non C mistakes have always been higher. And this is per date when we ship, when we introduce the flaw. Um, there, there's something to said to do the same, but when we found the flaw, because the last year or so, we have not found a single C mistake. I think I counted 17 non C mistake, the most recent ones until so the 18th sort of from from today going backwards, the 18th one was a C mistake. So maybe we are doing things slightly better so that we have reduced the risk of introducing C mistakes. I, I, I'd i like to think so. We introduced this Dune buff concept in, in the project for dynamic buffers, uh, dynamically hand managing you know, growing buffers. So to do that in a central focused way to more of a using, reusing the same function to do it instead of doing it, you know, manually doing realocs and stuff in, in many places. And I think, I really think this has helped the project to, to do better code and less risk for buffer mistakes. I guess the future will tell if it's actually true. I'll come, we can do the same presentation in a few more years and see if that red line maybe stays somewhere around there and doesn't climb too much, then I would say that it could be a sign. And here's another weird graph. Just look at the thicker um, green red ones. That's average time for a 
CV flaw to have been present in code based on C mistake or non C mistake. It mostly says that the C mistakes are found faster than the non C mistakes. It's easier to find the C mistake in the code. Probably because you can usually find it better with tools, and the ones that are not C mistakes are harder to find with tools. Okay, so to sum everything up. We have 125, 26 reported CVs over time. What do we learn from this on particular? What do we learn from the most recent CVs? What can we learn? You know, can we see any patterns improve? And sure, we had connection reuse problems, and we've had that a lot of times, four times in, in recent years. And with MetaLink problems twice, we removed MetaLink support as a direct result of that. Connection reuse, actually, that's that's a common pattern. Connection reuse is really hard. We've had several uh, security flaws in, in that aspect. And I'm not sure what to do that other than maybe refactoring the functions and, and adding more tests. Tra we did two security flaws with the trailing dot in, in host names. I don't know what we can do more to pr uh, improve that. I think we've, yeah, other than, you know, sure, reviewing code again, trying trying related things. That's usually what we do. and redirects that, so le that leaks sensitive data. We had that twice recently. Also, it's more of a things that are really difficult to find without just carefully reading, understanding the protocols and understanding what we're supposed to do and so on. So no, I actually have a really hard time to find trends or patterns and sort of lessons to learn what should we do better going forward when it comes to you know learn from the cvs what did we do wrong what should we do better going forward it's hard so if you if you have any patterns if you see things that i haven't please tell me and uh, um, i'll be happy to work on on whatever we need to do to reduce the uh, sort of the risk of us repeating the bad patterns in the future so I think we are in a pretty good place. So if you have any questions, fire them away. Of course, I do this recorded. So if you can only do these questions, if you actually find me after this recording. Thank you for watching and see you.